You know it's going to be a good interview when the audio-only recording session starts like this. Scott, you look great. <laughs> I try. <laughs> this is uh, I've got a I've got a face made for podcasting. What can I say? <laughs> In all seriousness, Josh Burnoff's credentials as an author and book consultant are impressive. And as someone personally who wants to write a book, plans to write a book, I had to make a confession to Josh. I, I mean, I can't tell you what a thrill it is just to be doing this because I'm just pleased to be talking with you, but also because I feel like it's going to be a personal therapy session, too. So. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do therapy in front of your entire audience, that, that works for me. Well, that's pretty much why I do a podcast. So, yeah. And so let's get into it and see what Josh has to say about book writing. This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore the values and principles that drive extraordinary leaders. We look for the timeless virtues that are just as relevant in the 21st century as they were in the first century. Universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Hi there, it's Scott Monty. Welcome back to Timeless Leadership. At least I hope I'm welcoming you back. If this is your first time here, welcome. Also, just the same. If you're not yet subscribed to the Timeless and Timely newsletter, now's a great time to start. Just click the link in the show notes there or go to TimelessTimely.com. It's on Substack. And you can uh, make sure you get some pithy words of, well, I don't want to necessarily call it wisdom, but at least insight. Looking to the past to try and divine our way through the present. See what examples we can use and be inspired. I think leadership is a journey of learning. And what better place to learn than from books? You know, we've been reading business books for a long time, probably a lot longer than you think. It's not just a 20th century invention. In fact, some people say that the first business book was as early as the 3rd century BC. The Science of Wealth, written by Cotilia. It was written in Sanskrit, titled Arthra Shastra, and it was written specifically to define economics as a specific element of statecraft. Now, I haven't read that book. I don't necessarily think it's something that's on my list, but from what I understand, one of the takeaways from the book is that it describes when it's appropriate for rulers to use prostitutes as paid assassins. So, if that's something that you feel like you need to get into, then please, by all means, go seek out the science of wealth. But the point here is that business books have been around for a long time. Fibonacci wrote the Book of the Abacus in 1202. Marco Polo wrote Description of the World in 1300. Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations in 1776. And if you want to stand apart today, in today's world, with all of the business books out there, according to Josh Burnoff, you have to have a unique perspective on the world, and you need to be able to articulate that perspective in a unique way, in a way that is going to make people pay attention to you. So if you have ever wondered about writing a book, or writing anything, really, Josh is the guy to listen to. But enough from me. Let's hear about Josh and from Josh right now. Josh Burnoff is an expert on how business books can propel thinkers to prominence. Book projects on which he collaborated have generated more than $20 million for their authors. His most recent book is called Build a Better Business Book, How to Plan, Write, and Promote a Book That Matters. Daniel Pink said this about it. If you're serious about writing a business book that matters, then look no further. Josh is also the author of Writing Without Bullshit, 
boost your career by saying what you mean. Toronto's Globe and Mail called it a strunk and white for the modern knowledge worker. He's also co-author of the Business Week bestseller Groundswell from 2008. He has authored, co-authored, or ghostwritten eight business books. And he works closely with nonfiction authors as an advisor, coach, editor, or ghostwriter. And he's collaborated on more than 45 nonfiction books. He writes a blog on topics of interest to authors every weekday at burnoff.com. He was formerly Senior Vice President, Idea Development at Forrester, where he spent 20 years analyzing technology and business. Prior to Forrester, Josh spent 14 years in startup companies in the Boston area. Josh has a mathematics degree from the Pennsylvania State University and studied mathematics in a PhD program at MIT. He lives with his wife, an artist, in Portland, Maine. Josh Burnoff, welcome to Timeless Leadership. It's great to be here with you. Well, I am, as I said, so excited to be talking with you because I'm a fan of reading. I'm a fan of writing, and you are at the nexus of both. You've uh, written books. You've helped other authors and executives and professionals write their books. And there's been one nagging question that I wanted to start off with, and that is, what holds someone back from writing a book? Huh. This really is a therapy session because what holds people back is not one answer. Um, I think that some people feel like they don't really have an idea that's strong enough to do a book about. And they're right. Because if you want to write a book, that's a lot of content. And you need to think some about how to make your idea bigger and more relevant and, and have more dimensions to it to make it worth a whole book. We've all read these books that are just like, you know, this is seven chapters of the same thing. Why didn't they just write a blog post? Right. Um, <laughs> um, the other thing that holds people back is their, their, is writer's block. They, they just feel like they go to sit down to write and they don't know what to write. And with the, as we can get into, if you want, with appropriate planning, I can uh, help people to get past that pretty easily. Um, and I think there's a fair amount of imposter syndrome. It's just, you know, just, I just imagine someone, let's just take a random example. Suppose someone has been doing digital marketing for nine years and they're like, oh man, I'm, I'm getting pretty good at, at, putting together brand messages and setting up marketing funnels and dealing with all of the tools. Maybe I should write a book about it. No, no, I'm not good enough. And I'm like, man, in nine years, you must have learned something. So, so <laughs> stop doubting yourself and just write the stuff down. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's really where it starts, doesn't it? I mean, just putting something on paper. I mean, that's where we all start, whether we mm. have a yeah. book in us or not. If we want to get that idea cemented, it's really about expressing it in some sort of permanent form. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I do this thing with authors. Uh, I, at the start of each book project, I almost always do this, and I've done 50 book projects now, so I have a lot of experience with it. Um, it's called an idea development session, and what I do is I connect now almost always virtually with the author and a third person that stands in for the audience. And I just say, what's your idea? And the author explains it. And then I say, uh, I don't get it. What's, what's clever about that is it, it requires no intelligence on my part. Um, <laughs> right. And then they, then they say, no, 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 it's this. And then they explain it more clearly. And I say, no, I still don't get it. And then they're like, damn it. This is what it is. And I'm like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Now you've explained it in terms that anybody can understand. And that process of listening for the words that might be their title or subtitle, understanding who their audience is, uh, you know, clarifying what's unique about their idea versus what other people have said, th they end up basically excited about their own idea. And that is the challenge is to basically say, no, I have something unique and interesting to say. And now I know what it is. 
Well, I mean, what you've really described there are the fundamentals of communication, getting out of our own head and into the shoes of the audience we're trying to reach. You know, whether you're writing a speech, a book, uh, an email, or even a text message, this is kind of indicative of what it means to be a good communicator. It's interesting that you say that. I think we have now made it possible for people to communicate more easily and in more ways than ever before. Mm. You can do a tweet or a podcast or a, uh, you know, you can, you can call someone, you can text them, you can send them a direct message on, on Instagram or, you know, uh, any of a thousand ways. And yet when it's people sit down and they say, okay, now I have to communicate an idea with depth to people who are going to read. It's like, oh man, I'm, I just don't remember how to do that. <laughs> I've sent too many text messages now. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's amazing. Those building blocks are there, but uh, you need to kind of extricate yourself from it from time to time. Yeah. So uh, when, when you've worked with authors, you, you, you mentioned 50 book projects that you've yeah. been a part of, give or take, and I'm sure you've witnessed many others as a bystander. Mm. Um what do you typically hear from people that they are trying to accomplish by writing a book? In other words, what, what's the intent behind writing a book in the first place? Well, I actually surveyed 242 uh, business and other nonprofit authors for the book I just wrote called Build a Better Business Book. Um, and I asked that question. And the number one reason uh, by far was to share the knowledge that I had. So, you know, pe people, the, the second reason was to boost my reputation. So it isn't as if people are completely selfless, but the thing that motivates people is they say, I know something that other people don't know. I know how content marketing works. I know how to use AI, uh, in marketing campaigns, or I know, uh, what, what it takes to manage a group of people that are working from home. You know, these, these are new problems and they're like, ah, oh, I've got this figured out. Now I have to share it. And that is really the motivational thing. And if you read books where the person's like, I've done this, these are the things I learned. I interviewed other people who did it. Here's the way to do it right. That, that tends to be popular. Whereas if you read a book that's like, I'm great, here's why I'm great, here are all the reasons I'm great, it's like, sorry, not interested. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that actually gets me to an underlying question there, and I think you identified it there in uh, validating your numbers. And that is, when, when you think about writing a nonfiction book, a business book, do you need to do research? Do you need to do uh, data compilation and uh, you know some of the uh, more more mathematical elements of uh, of business, or can they simply be a compilation of stories? So to answer your question directly, the way you asked it, yes, damn it, you need to do research, right? So uh, without research, you're just rambling and you're not really communicating anything that is credible. But research takes a number of different forms. There's uh, secondary research, and every book has a lot of that. So this is searching the web and other books, finding justification, quoting other people's statistics, quoting other people's perspectives. Um, you know, that's really good. And it's also helpful if you give people appropriate credit when you quote, quote them. But for a book to be worth doing, it needs to have some form of primary research. And there are a number of ways to do that. If you have the ability to collect and share data that hasn't been seen before, that's great. People just are really eager for surveys. And at, at Forrester Research, where I worked for 20 years, I actually originated their consumer data uh, service called Technographics. Um, and it was just such a luxury that no matter what we had to say, I'm like, do we have any data on this? Oh, look, here's a, here's a survey of 5,000 consumers. I can quote that. Uh, but it's not necessary to have data. You can also get 
uh, anecdotal information from interviews. Um, and some of the most compelling things, I'd say it's almost a requirement for a business book, is to talk to people who are in the situation that you're describing and then tell their story. This is what it was like to uh, change from a profit-making company to a nonprofit. Or this is what it was like to raise capital for my startup. Or this is what it was like to uh, go from junior management to senior management at a, at a large organization. And the more people's stories that you can tell, the more interesting your book is and the better off it will be. I, I'd even go this far. I'd say the biggest flaw that I find when I start working with people who are well into a book is that they don't have enough of those stories. Hmm. Well, and uh, talk a little bit more about that because I, I think stories – are both overrated and underrated. I think they're overrated in terms of the way people just casually refer to them, and yet they're underrated in terms of how important they are to uh, pushing a narrative, particularly in a nonfiction book, forward. Um, how do we how do we get compelling stories from a, a business perspective? Yeah, you know, uh, I wrote about this recently. There was a a guy who complained about the stories in specifically in books on economics, which he called Malcolm's that's they're named after, uh, the guy who uses them all the time. Uh, uh, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. Right. And he was always telling these stories <laughs> at the beginning. And the problem with he's skilled at it. If you're unskilled, you're like, let me tell this story that you already heard seven times and then use it to justify <laughs> some idea that it has no connection to, you know, um, like, uh, one of my favorites is that that uh, uh, Harry Truman said that he wanted to have a uh, one-handed economist because that way he couldn't say, well, on the one hand and then on the other hand. Right? <laughs> um, OK, but that's that's a quip. And, and, you know, now next time you see that, you're going to be like, I already heard that from Josh. The, the unique stories are the ones that are people in the actual situation. I, I did something insane with my book. My book has 24 chapters, and every chapter starts with a story about an author, an author who had writer's block, an author who did an effective job of promoting their book and how they did it, an author who used graphics effectively, an author, in in that case it was myself, who reacted extremely negatively to the cover of their book and then later realized that it was actually great. Uh, and... You read these things and you're like, oh, okay, well, if that guy did it or that woman did it, I guess I could do it. How do I do that? And then we take the lessons of those stories and weave them into the recommendations. And that pe – people just just love that stuff. Um, I'd go so far as to say uh, if you're writing a book chapter and you start with a story that's originally research, you know, right, that's primary research that you did – at the end of the story, you say, what can we learn from this? Whatever the next sentence is after that, people will believe. Honest to that God. Makes sense. It's, it's, it's just like, oh, okay. So that's the lesson. Okay, I can take that away. And they will remember that. And then they're like, well, how do I do that? That's what the rest of the chapter is about. Yeah, that's that's a great reminder. I mean, ultimately, these aren't just collections of stories. These are a narrative that's designed to push us in a particular direction. I mean, when you were describing uh, so many of the books uh, a few minutes ago, uh, there were a lot of how to, and I think that's what, that's the thirst of knowledge. People want to know how to do things differently, how to respond in a particular environment. Uh, we're just, we're, we, we've got this wonderful thirst for uh, understanding the world through other people's experiences and the stories are the conveyance to help drive that forward. Yeah. I mean, if you look at a nonfiction book, I'm mostly helping people with how to's, but you know, what else is there? There's historical narratives. They're full of stories. And then they're like big idea books. Well, if you can't tell people what to do about it, then what difference does the idea make? So yeah, it's, we got to give people advice in these books or it doesn't count. Well, in, in terms of uh, putting all of this together, where you've got your idea, you've got your research, uh, you, you've got your uh, overall narrative, I'm, I'm interested in uh, this 
discernment between types of authors, uh, one that you've called a planner, the other you've called a pantser. <laughs> what are those? Okay. So first of all, I should be clear that I stole those terms from fiction writing. Uh, and uh, you can tell the difference because the pantsers are the miserable ones. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, so a planner says, okay, I have this book to write. Hmm. How will I organize the chapters? Okay. The first chapter has to scare the crap out of people to get them interested. And then each chapter after that needs to answer one of the key questions. And in order to assemble that chapter, I need to put together stories and primary research and how to's and argumentation and statistics and whatever else and assemble it into something that, that makes sense. And then when the time comes to write that chapter, they have what they need. Pantsers are people who write by the seat of their pants. So it's like, oh, it's time for me to write a book. Type, 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 type. Hmm. Okay. What should I write next? Type, type, type. Um, and my favorite example here is from a, a really, really talented author uh, who's in the author's group that, that I'm in, in on Facebook who, who wrote, uh, help, I am 75,000 words into my 60,000 word book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and, and I was just like, I know exactly where you are and I know exactly how you got there. Because if you just keep writing without a plan, if you are a pantser, you're going to end up with this collection of stuff that's not organized, that has a bunch of duplication. You did stuff in chapter two, you did it again in chapter six, and it's got holes in it. You're like, oh, geez, I forgot this part. So, yeah, you can do that and then take that apart and reassemble it and fix the problems and turn it into a book. But it's a lot more efficient to start with planning. And then when the time comes to write, you know exactly what you need to do and what role that writing needs to play for the book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And, and uh, speaking personally, you know, I, a couple of years ago, I went and I printed out every newsletter that I sent the previous two years. So it would have been, I guess, 2020 and 2021 for my timeless and timely newsletter. And I thought, there's a lot of good stuff here. And I look at the stacks of paper that came out and the variety of topics that I covered there. And I go, this is, this is not simply a matter of taking newsletters or blog posts and turning them into a book. Now I have to disassemble everything, come up with the plan, right? And figure out how these pieces fit in and then fill in the gaps from there. And it's, let me tell you, it's very daunting to go about it that way. Well, Despite what I just said, my last two books were written mostly by compiling blog posts. Um, people don't, they're like, really? Why does it hang together so well? And the reason is that, that my blog posts were all filling holes. So mm. I'm like, I'm like, oh, I learned something about book uh, cover graphics today. Why don't mm. I write that up? Because that's going to need to be in the book somewhere. Oh, I had a really... Uh, uh, you know, a revelation about uh, how people react to editing. Well, I know there's going to be a chapter on editing, so let's write that up. Um, so you can audition content that way. But if you, I mean, your newsletters are brilliant, but they, they're they not created as if they are part of a an overall perspective. And that's why disassembling them. I, I, if you want, I'm going to give you advice on how to turn your newsletters into, into a book right now. Okay. Um, okay. This is, this is the, uh, the sticky note method. Okay. So what you do is you go into your newsletters and take each piece. That's like a, a nugget of information and you write it on a sticky note. Um, and you, you color code the sticky notes. So maybe the p pink sticky notes are about leadership and the blue sticky notes are about management and the orange sticky notes are about technology change, right? But you, you basically do that. And now you've taken what's might be, you know, a hundred thousand words of, of content and reduced it to, uh, you know, uh, 51 sticky notes. So now you have to do is, all you have to do is organize the sticky notes, sticky notes and put them in the right order. 
and then you can make a book out of it. That is a brilliant suggestion, Josh, and it's way better than what I was considering, which was to create a an Excel spreadsheet or a database and and put topics next to each one and try to make sense of, out of it that way. I think the yeah, that's you know it's functionally equivalent, but yeah, you got the right idea. Yeah, uh, it, it just it needs organization, and I think that's that's where a planner actually succeeds is is thinking organizationally, thinking compartmentally uh, beforehand and. In your case, you knew you wanted to write, uh, build a better business book, and everything you did was targeted that way. Now, you didn't necessarily write all of those blog posts or newsletters in the order in which they appear in the book, but you actually created the content with that bigger container in mind. That that was the idea. And there's a bunch of stuff that, that also was like, oh, uh, well, this doesn't belong in the book, or I already have enough on this, that my book's too long but it says a comprehensive guide for authors on the front. So uh, it has to cover everything. Most business books should be f these days about 50,000 50, words. That's maybe 200 pages. Um, but if you're going to write a comprehensive guide, it's hard to draw the line. <laughs> yeah. Now, have you seen any trends lately in terms of the length of business books. I, I, I saw a discussion recently where people are saying that shorter books yeah. are more in demand these days. Oh, it's definitely true. I think people have shorter attention spans. So, mm -hmm. yes, definitely shorter books. Um, so, first of all, people think in terms of pages, but, of course, the number of pages depends on the typeface and the page size and stuff like that. And if you say, I've written, uh, you know, 116 pages of text i don't really know how big that is so yeah. people should be using word counts and uh the shorter books now are in uh, like 35 to 40,000 words that's a pretty skinny book mm -hmm. um 50,000 is typical 65,000 used to be pretty standard and now it is fairly long and uh uh, novels are a hundred thousand words, but if you have a hundred thousand word nonfiction book, then the publisher is going to tell you to cut a whole bunch of stuff out of it. Um, I, I can't resist sharing this when I, when, when, uh, Ted Shadler and I wrote, uh, the second book I worked on at, at Forrester research, we turned it into the editor at Harvard business press. And she said, cut 10,000 words. That was the entire editorial comment. Which words? <laughs> That's your problem, right? <laughs> and it was fun. There was there was and I, I there was some stuff in there that my co-author had put in that I was like, this doesn't belong in there. And I'm like, ah, this is my excuse to take out those those <laughs> twenty five hundred words that I didn't like. I'm like, okay, Ted, sorry, this has to go because we have to cut ten thousand words. <laughs> well, and um, it makes you wonder if the editor even read the manuscript at that point, or if she just looked at the word count and goes, send it back. And then I, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, um, and that, that actually brings up an important question. How important is it to have an editor for your book? I mean, obviously we do our own self editing to a certain point, but how important is it to have a third party editor, even if you're self publishing? Um, it's more important if you're self publishing. So first hmm. of all, if you're going to a traditional publisher, these days, most traditional publishers expect you to deliver a, a publishable manuscript, which means any editorial feedback is your responsibility uh, and you, you need to hire an editor to help you. Um, unless you're perfect and you aren't. So, so like, uh, on my previous book to this one, the, the editorial comment was, you should have something in there about writing for women because it was a book about writing. So that was her, her entire editorial feedback. And I did do that. I went and asked women about what it was like for them. To, to do writing and what the challenges they had with writing in the workplace. And I got some really useful stuff back, <laughs> but, but that doesn't count as being you know, an editor for the whole book. That was just one little comment. If you are uh, self-publishing or if you're going to a hybrid publisher, which is uh, 
a publisher that you hire as opposed to one that pays you in advance, uh, you still need an editor. And the job of the, people think the job of the editor is to edit the text. No, the job of the editor is to use their skill with text to stand in for the reader. Because the editor is like, oh, you've, you've used the word. This actually was an example from a book that I edited. You've used the word leverage 116 times <laughs> in this 50,000 word book. So uh, you don't really know what that means. And we need to change that. Um, or you've written everything in the passive voice and that makes it seem very distant from the reality that the, reader is experiencing or or this chapter is organized in a way that doesn't make sense and here's a better way to organize it um mm. i can't resist one of my favorite comments that i gave to uh another authors uh and he was so enamored of it that he actually shared my comments online it's like look look at the nasty stuff my editor said i said this story that you told is extremely interesting. However, it makes exactly the opposite point of the one you're trying to make here. <laughs> okay. So, so these are the things the editor has a perspective that the author cannot possibly have. And an expert editor not only finds the problems, they also suggest the solutions. Yeah. Well, let's, let's say that you, you're not in the market to self publish. You know, that you want to go a more traditional route. You want to find a publisher. Um, how how does one even start at finding a publisher? And do you need to have the book written before you actually uh, send it in? Now, writing the book before you get a deal is a rookie mistake. You don't want to do that uh, because, first of all, the they don't want to read the manuscript. They just want to read a description of what the manuscript will include. Um, plus, if they buy it, the the publisher may say, no, change this and this and this. And you're like, oh, well, geez, I just wrote 50,000 words. Now I have to start and fix it. So no, what you need is not a manuscript. What you need is a proposal. And a book proposal includes a description of the market, a uh, sample chapter, detailed table of contents, but strangely, to some people, the most important part of your book proposal is the marketing section in which you describe the actions you will take to help sell the book. And if you think that's the publisher's job, no, not anymore. Now it's your job as the author. So I have, you know, 100,000 Twitter followers, which is these days worth about the same as 5,000 people on threads. Um, <laughs> I have, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I, I have... Uh, I'm not even allowed to say Twitter. Now it's called X, I guess, based on that's what, what we've heard. I, uh, I have, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, I give 50 speeches a year. I have a column in entrepreneur magazine, whatever the, the, the things are that you can use to promote the book. They need to hear about that. So the proposal is a one element. The second thing you need is an agent. And you can approach publishers without an agent, but they're much more likely to pay attention if it goes through an agent. And the agent also will get people bidding on the book so you get the best possible deal. And they know who's buying and which company just stopped acquiring business books and, uh, you know, who's got an opening in their, their spring list or whatever. So they have all the inside knowledge. And the best way to get an agent interested, again, is to have a really great proposal. So a proposal and an agent is what you need to sell the book. Then that gets sold. And at that point, you take your sample chapter and your table of contents that you already wrote, and you do the rest of the work of completing that and turning it into a book. Piece of cake. <laughs> I, I, I like to say that doing the book proposal is approximately 25% of the work of doing the book. Because between defining the idea, writing the sample chapter, defining the table of contents, getting a clear description of the audience and of, and writing a, a plan for your marketing, which you'll be using later, you've done a lot of what you need to do to begin planning the book. And that kind of brings me to the, the other bookend, which, which is the marketing of it, the, the launch, the success, the, um, 
you know, everything you do to promote the book, what level of effort would you say that comprises? And what are some interesting and unique approaches you've seen? Well, from what I've seen, the most important thing is to get on the Scott Monty podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck to you. <laughs> okay. But beyond that, um, so uh, what approaches have I seen? Uh, you know, every book marketing plan is unique, and that's because every book is unique and every author's promotional resources are unique. Um, I once ghost wrote a book for the CEO of – a major AI company. And he had a really good relationship with Thomas L. Friedman, the, uh, the New York times columnist. And not only did we get the Thomas L. Friedman to write a forward for the book, but he actually wrote a column about the book mm -hmm. in the New York times, which is like, th nobody gets that. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so, you know, that guy had that unique ability to do that. But everyone has a unique I, – I, there was another author I talked to. He didn't have any social media following. He didn't give a lot of speeches. And then at one point in my discussion with him, he said, oh, well, because of the way my company is, I have the ability to deliver uh, millions and millions of remnant advertising impressions every month for nothing. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That's worth a lot. That's, that's a pretty insane asset. Um, so, uh, if I could just describe this in the simplest possible way, I have a little acronym here, PQRST. P is your positioning, who is your audience, and what is what kind of book is it, like a how-to book or a big idea book. Q is what question does not answer, you know, how can I generate more uh, content marketing ideas, uh, you know, what's the future of work and how does that affect managers jobs things like that um and r s and t are the tactics r is reach how are you going to reach as many people as possible by tapping into uh the various you know owned earned and paid media that you have uh s is spread what stuff are you going to give these people to sh that they can share infographics bits of video um bits of audio um you know, excerpts, whatever. Um, and T is timing because in contrast to most marketing, the, in this case, it has to be launched over a very narrow period of time of about a month before the book publishes and two months after the book publishes. That's what has to be where you concentrate your marketing effort. And the reason is because the reader, potential reader is going to be like, Oh, that sounds like an interesting book that I heard about on Scott Monty's podcast. And then they forget. And then they say, Oh, look, here's a person who wrote it up in their, in their blog. And then they forget. And then they say, Oh, wait, there's a tweet about this from somebody else that I follow. Geez, I keep hearing about this. It must be a good book. So unless you can hit them multiple times in that window, you don't actually tip them over into getting the book, reading it, and then hopefully talking to other people about how great it is. Yeah, a lot of lot of ins and outs there, but um, it's again, this is why being a planner <laughs> takes a lot more sense than a pantser <laughs> yeah. when it comes to uh, your book. Yes, that's right. Well, uh, I, I'm just uh, blown away by not only the practical nature of your book here, but the the breadth of advice. I mean, everything from uh, what we've been talking about to lots more details uh, as well, uh, getting your cover done and blurbs and audiobooks and all the rest. But I strongly recommend that people run out and pick up a copy of Build a Better Business Book, How to Plan, Write, and Promote a Book That Matters by the one and only Josh Burnoff. Josh, any last bits of wisdom for us here before we sign off? Well, as long as we're doing plugs, people can find out what my latest advice is. I do a blog post every day at burnoff.com slash blog and um, a newsletter. Now it's coming out every week or two on LinkedIn. So just, just follow me there. Um, and the general advice I have for people is to recognize that this is going to be a huge amount of work if they want it to pay off. 
But if you know things that other people don't know about your field, if you have that experience, if you have the ability to do the research to back that up, you can create a book that makes an impact. 87% of the people in my author survey that were published said that they were glad that they they did the work and published the book. So um, it's an experience that, that people generally feel pretty positive about as long as they're prepared for the amount of effort it, that it takes to do it right. Well stated. Timeless advice from Josh Burnoff. Josh, thanks so much for being on Timeless Leadership. Scott, it's been great to be here. Thanks. So what do you think? Are you ready to go write your book now? Well, if you've had that idea rolling around in your head, start planning. Give yourself some time to think it through. Pick up a copy of Josh's book and get to it. Special thanks to Josh Burnoff for joining us today. Our theme music is Americana Aspiring by Kevin McLeod. The music bed for Josh's bio was I Don't Want to Do This Without You by Late Night Feeler. As you share yourself with the world, anytime you help people learn more, either about themselves or about the world, you, my friend, are practicing timeless leadership. I'm Scott Monty, and until next time, remember, there's so much to learn.